A big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. Can you see me? Okay, in this video, what I'm gonna do is show you how that you can stitch images together to create something that's over 100 megapixels like this. So the detail on this is just so incredible. Morning everybody, fantastic to see you all again. So I've had so many questions about this image that I took a couple of weeks ago in the Lake District where I mentioned that I'd stitched 14 or 15 images together and everyone asked me how I did it, you know, what, what techniques I used and I thought it'd be really good to do a video and explain exactly how I did it because it's something I do all the time to create all sorts of different types of images, um, not just panoramas and yeah, it's a super simple technique and there's a real simple trick as well in Lightroom that probably not a lot of people know about that I'll tell you towards the end of the video. And also, I often stitch photos that aren't just pan panoramas. You know, the classic panoramas like this one from the Faroe Islands or this one from the Lake District. You know, quite often I'm stitching photos that look like they could have been taken by a normal camera like this one here from Torridon and this one here from the Faroe Islands which is more of a vertical pa pano. So basically you can stitch just about anything, but how do you do it? So what I wanna do is go through what tools I use, um, how I do it in the field, and how I edit the final image as well. And it's all really, really easy to do. So before I do that, let's just talk about why I do it. So the first one, the obvious one, is panos like these, where the more that letterbox type shot where you've taken maybe five to 10 images horizontally and you've stitched them together to create a pano, that's the obvious one but there are lots of other reasons to stitch images together. So for instance, sometimes when I'm shooting a scene like this one here from Torridon, and I've got just like maybe just a little bit more um, information that I need on the left and right, and I don't actually want to go wider because then I'd have to crop the top and bottom, which is probably fine on my Z7 that's got 45 megapixels, but if you've got a 20, 24 megapixel camera, then you don't want to lose those megapixels. So by staying at the same focal length and just moving the camera left and right and grabbing some more information is a really good way of just stitching it together and creating um, a better quality image. I do that quite a lot of the time, both horizontally and vertically, which I'll get to later. The other thing is, you know, you wanna just get a higher resolution image. Maybe you wanna print it higher resolution, or maybe you wanna crop in afterwards. So take this shot here when I was in the Lake District shooting down on this amazing sort of mist in, in the valley here. Uh, I've spoken about this image before, but, it, but what's good about it is that you can crop in and, and get lots of different compositions from this one image. So, you know, being able to do panos, this ended up being a 300 megapixel um, triple layer pano. So, um, yeah, you, you can do really quite clever things with your images. Okay, so what do you need? What, what do you need to actually do this? Well, your hands, basically. Um, you know, the base, the most basic form of it is just shooting a pan, panorama with your hands. And you'd be amazed at how often I do that. Uh, you know, all these images here have all been taken as handhold panoramas. And if you've got a reasonable amount of light, especially with IBIS, then you, know, you can shoot down to maybe a 10th, 15th of a second and get super sharp images. And then the other way of doing it is doing it on a tripod. Now, if you're doing it on a tripod, then you need to make sure your tripod's level. You can obviously level it with the legs, but that's fairly cumbersome to do. So what I use is I just use one of these leveling heads here. Um, you can just stick that on your tripod. It's not that, it doesn't add much weight and it just makes it much easier to level your ball head because it's your ball head that's got to be level, um, not the top of your ball head, the bottom of the ball head. And what this allows you to do you can see there's a level on it here and you can just loosen it off and it's really easy just to level it when it's on your tripod. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really good thing. I'd definitely pick it up. The link to this is the Benro one is in the description. The, the other thing you can get for your tripod is a nodal head. I've never used a nodal head, but what that basically does is it means that the nodal point of your lens um, is on the pivot point that you're moving around, and it means that you don't get any parallax error. So it's good if you're doing wider angle shots and, and to make the stitching easier. But to be honest, I've never had a problem with any of the things that I've done not using one of those, so I don't think you need one. And then how do you do it when you're in the field? So if we just go for the basic version, which is the handheld, 
handheld version, then what you need to do is you need to find the scene that you want to shoot, like I was in the Lake District doing this one, and then all you need to do is um, shoot in portrait, and then make sure that you expose for the highlights of, of your scene. Um, and if you've got a lot of dynamic range across the scene, which quite often you might have, then make sure you take multiple exposures on each shot. And what I tend to do if I'm doing that is I just set my camera to shoot three or five exposures, usually at a two third of a stop and one and a third stop above and the same below. Um, and then when you click the shutter button, it just takes those five or three shots. And then all you do is you just move around, making sure that you're overlapping each shot by 50% and just taking the shot. The key is to make sure that you're following the horizon level. So what I tend to do is I look for a point that I think uh, in my scene that's, that's the same level, the same point above the horizon. And if you haven't got an, an, a horizon like the seascape, then what I tend to do is work out roughly um, where that might be on the scene, and I keep one of the grid lines on my camera on that point as I go around. You don't have to get it exactly right, but it just means the stitching isn't wonky afterwards. Um, I never get it perfect, but it's usually good enough. And then if you're doing it vertically, then you just overlap vertically as well. I tend to do more wider angle ones vertically. It tends to be when I've got a wide angle lens, um, and I can't quite get enough sky in, and I'll just do a shot down below um, of, of, of the foreground, and I'll do another shot of the sky. It's also good, you can dual purpose that as well and stack it as a, um, a focus stack and a pano. So it allows you to do two things in one if, you, if you're doing that with a wide angle lens. In terms of focal length, and I usually use between 30 and 60 millimeters. Um, you, you don't really want to go much wider than 30, although obviously you can. I just mentioned I, I do it sometimes, but it, but usually between 30 and 60, because you usually in, in these types of shots uh, haven't got any foreground, you've only got mid-ground and distance. So 30 millimeters to 60 millimeters is a good range. You can go above that as well, but you just need to take a lot more shots to get, to get the scene in. And I usually shoot the best aperture for the lens because again I don't really care too much about depth of field usually so I'm usually shooting around about f8 on, on, on my lens. And then the other thing I mentioned is don't use a polarizer because a polarizer will create some strange effects when you're going across a wide expanse of sky so I'd avoid using a polarizer. Okay onto the secret trick that you can do that may, maybe you didn't know in Lightroom and that that is exactly what I did on this shot that I took in the, in the Lake District and why I ended up with so many images is you can do dual layers of, of stacks as well. So I can shoot maybe five or six shots across, move down, and then shoot back across the other way. And Lightroom's really clever. It just stitches them together. You don't have to worry about it. As long as you've overlapped them by around about sort of 35 to 50%, then it just works it all out and it just stitches it all together and it is really good. I've, I've never had any issues with it. So that means that you can just create an even bigger file and, and create something that then doesn't look like a pano because you've got more, um, it, more data below the image and above the image. You're effectively just doing a wider field of view and creating a lot more megapixels. Okay, I'm gonna grab my computer and we'll look at Lightroom and how we stitch these together once we've got them, um, once we've taken them and got them in Lightroom. Right, so I've got Lightroom in front of me now and what I'm gonna do is just show you that shot from the lakes. So you can see here that I've got lots of images that I took just moving to the, to the side every time I did it. And I, I probably overlapped it by about 60% here. And you can see at this point, I moved down and then moved back across. And if I select all those, now I probably should have done uh, an exposure stack as well. So I probably at each image, I should have taken uh, an image that was two thirds or a stop brighter and two thirds or a stop um, darker but I didn't because I was rushing because the light was changing really quickly. Um, but it's fine, the dynamic range of the Nikon is amazing and, and it's come out fine. So all you do is select those images and right click and then you just click Photo Merge Panorama. If I'd have got a, a shot if I'd have got some different exposures for each of those images, I'd click HDR Panorama and that would create um, the image with a lot more 
a, a lot broader dynamic range as well, which you would then be able to use as you're editing it. And, and the thing to remember here is that I'm using raw images and the output file is raw. So uh, it doesn't create a JPEG image, it doesn't create a TIFF, it creates a, a DNG image, which is a raw image, which you can then edit just as you're editing these raw images. So I don't edit any of these images before I do this stack. I always do the edit after to the stack. So I click panorama, and that then goes and creates this panorama um, preview. Whilst it's doing that, I can talk briefly about the spherical, cylindrical, and perspective and parts of this, the spherical is, just think of a, a ball like that and the images are gonna to fit to the inside of a ball. That works quite well if you've got a, a, maybe a 360 or you've got something that's a bit wider and you've got more sky and more um, f uh, foreground. I usually use cylindrical, um, that usually works quite well. You can see that this is, this is okay. And what it shows you then is the image. Now I never click auto settings because you want to edit it yourself afterwards and it creates this horrible HDR looking image. Um, you can click auto crop or you can crop it afterwards. It doesn't really matter. Whatever you do there, you can change afterwards anyway. Fill edges, basically what it does is it does a content aware fill on all the white areas. On this, it's probably gonna do that okay, but you gotta be careful if you've got twigs, branches, or anything like rock detail there where it's not gonna do a great job of it. Because this is sky and then some dark areas, I think using fill edges, it will do a really good job of making that more usable space for me. However, having said that, I probably would have been fine anyway. So once you've done that, you click merge and it creates an image. And this is that image that it created. And then I've gone along and edited that image. And you can see that the, the detail in it is spectacular. I can zoom in and you can see I'm looking at a tiny area here and it is so amazing, the quality of the, of the image with, when it's stacked like this. So I wanted to, I've just got some news on this image as well, but before I, I, I say that, I wanted to just mention Squarespace that have sponsored this midweek video. Thanks a lot, Squarespace. If you're looking for a website or a domain, then make sure you go to squarespace.com. And if you're ready to purchase it, then you can go to squarespace.com forward slash Nigel to get 10% off or use offer code Nigel. Now, I also have uploaded this image into my portfolio with Squarespace and I've created a code using Squarespace because it's super easy to do that called Pano30 which gives you 30% off if you're really interested in this image because I've had quite a few people message me saying you should put it in your portfolio. I've spent the sort of week with it and I've edited it quite a lot and just tweaked it a little bit. I printed out a small version as you saw in last week's video um, and yeah, I, I th I'm really, really happy with it. I think it definitely deserves a place in my portfolio. So I'm adding it in there. It will look amazing printed big, this image, because there's so much detail. And any image that I've got that's a pano on my website, then you can get 30% off with the offer code pano30. That's it. Thanks ever so much for watching. And until Sunday, when I'm going to be in Wales, actually. So you'll see a video from Wales on Sunday, um, back out in the field, which is great news. Um, back out in my camper van as well. Thanks a lot for watching and bye. Oh, I've just remembered. Um, somebody asked, because I'm not going to be, this is probably the last midweek video I'm going to do for a while. Is the hash 2020 ND hash, um, hashtag still going on Instagram. Yes, it is. I still look at them and I'll still um, either post some things on Instagram about those images or I'll post um, some winners from those images on a monthly basis, probably on my Sunday video. So make sure you keep publishing your images to hash 2020 ND. As much as anything, it's a great place and a great community to be able to share images from people that are, are interested in landscape photography. Okay, bye.